Hey everyone, ELD here, and the ELD CEDH Open is Sunday, May 15th. That is this Sunday, just a few days away. There are a handful of spots left available, so if this is something you want to have some fun at, have a chance at a random underground seed door prize, go ahead, link in the description, pause the video, take care of that, because once those spots are gone, that is it. We've got 30-something people signed up. It's capping at 40. Give you a second to do that. All right, so we are back. No proxies, playtests, or counterfeit cards allowed at this event. This is coordinated through Wizards of the Coast website. That's their rules. I'm going to respect that. We can talk about it in the future if we're going to keep doing these. But I mean, this is this may just be a once in a lifetime event. I mean, an underground sea is a door prize. Obviously, we can't be doing that. We'd be going out of business. That was donated by a member of our community. It's truly a once in a lifetime thing. The Rest of the tournament structure does work. That is in line with the rest of our events. 100% of entries to the players in the elimination rounds. In this case, it's going to be top 16. And of course, this is going to be pods of four. So basically, with 40 people, you can expect if you win two of your matches to go ahead and make it into that top 16. And some people that only win one match will have a chance at making the top 16. That's going to be based off of tiebreakers. The tougher the tables that you've played at, the better your tiebreakers are going to be. This is an important point, match draws versus game draws. So in a tournament setting, it's often incorrectly referred to as two out of three when you're playing regular constructed magic. It's not. It's not best of three. It's not two out of three. What you're actually going to do is go until someone wins two games. So in this setup, we're going to go until someone wins one game. That means if there's a draw, for example, a World Gorge or Dragon Loop, then that draw happens and then everyone at the table is now playing in the next game and that will continue until somebody wins a game at the end of the round when time expires at that point if people are still playing then anyone left in the round it's going to be one extra turn per person of course it is cedh so somebody might end up taking all of those turns for themselves but if there's four people left, there's going to be four extra turns. If there's two people left, two extra turns. At the end of that, if nobody has managed to win, then that table will actually get a draw. So that everyone at the table will get one point. The only options here are win, which is three points, lose, zero, or a draw, everyone at the table ends up getting a point. Priority passing. So I've noticed people that haven't played in a ton of tournaments Priority passing can be a little bit foreign. It can feel a little formal, but it's going to be very important to understand this in this setting. We're playing for big prizes, and I'll go ahead and lay this out. So basically, if you're the active player, you put an effect on the stack. If you'd like that to resolve, you pass priority. That's going to go to your person to your left, then their left, their left, then back to you. If that person passes back to you, then that top ability of the stack is going to resolve. You can no longer respond to it. So for example, if you have Lion's Eye Diamond, and Infernal Tutor, you couldn't play the Infernal Tutor and then pass priority and then check and see if somebody's going to counter it before you crack your Lion's Eye Diamond. You actually have to put all of the effects on the stack that you would like and then pass priority. Same thing with Thassa's Oracle. If you play Thassa's Oracle and you have Demonic Consultation in hand, you can't wait to see if everybody's going to pass on her trigger before you Demonic Consultation. You actually would be at that point too late her triggered ability would resolve and you'd be stuck with a demonic consultation in non-deterministic loops are going to be allowed for this event a lot of higher level strategies within cedh do use non-deterministic loops and basically if you're bringing one of these to the tournament you're going to want to make sure that you understand it well enough to be able to explain it to the other players and make sure that they understand kind of where they could interact for example so you just have to be able to explain it clearly at that point. If they do want to interact, they can. If they do not interact, then we're going to let that loop play out. So if, for example, uh, you've got something that's going to just, uh, like the Gitrog, continuously recur Lotus Petals, we can get to the point where there is a arbitrary amount of mana, like you can name an amount of mana, and then also have a empty graveyard, for example, because the 
Eldrazi triggers would have gone through. So we can work to get to that point, but for the most part, I expect people to be conceding uh, once the opponent has it locked up. There's really no benefit. Like, they will actually beat you, and, you know, there's only one game in the match, so it's not like you can make somebody waste a bunch of time and then cause some type of different result for the match. It's They're going to win, so we're not going to stand in the way of that uh, unless we've got a way to actually do so with cards. There's not going to be any clock manipulation in that regard. Uh, in that note, uh, concessions are going to be expected during the main phase with an empty stack. So, for example, if I play Praetor's Grasp targeting you, uh, you're not going to just be conceding in response to that. There are a few different things in the format uh, where concessions work. Of course, if there's an emergency you you need to leave the tournament, by all means, like, just leave. Like, that's, I mean, it's kind of ridiculous to even equate the two. That's not what we're talking about. Uh, if you do need to leave, for whatever reason, hope, I mean, you don't have that happen in pretty much ever, but if that did happen, then you'd be able to leave. But in terms of the gameplay, if you're going to be conceding for tactical reasons, and there are some that are totally valid, but that is going to need to be during your main phase with an empty stack. Uh, also an important note here, missed triggers. So if you miss your trigger, your opponents do not need to remind you. That is not on them. That is on you. If any of them wants the trigger to go on the stack, they can remind you, and then you'd need to put the, the trigger on the stack. Uh, if you remember your missed trigger later, missed your trigger. Like, that's it. So it's really up to the opponent if they want to remind you. But if you've missed your trigger, you've missed it. Now, that is very different than maintaining the game state. I got to say, if you're not sure about that, you want to... I guess I'll explain it here. I'm not actually sure a great resource to, to bring you up to speed. But everyone's responsible for maintaining the game state. Missed triggers are the exception to that rule. So if, for example, you play a Supreme Verdict and you notice somebody has a Dryad Arbor and they didn't put it in the graveyard, if that could benefit you and you don't say anything about it, that is actually cheating. You're getting DQ'd. You don't even have a chance at the underground. See, you really need to make sure that you are maintaining the game state and have illegal board states, life totals and everything have to be accurate. Only exception to this is for missed triggers. So really the way you want to look at it is everybody cooperating to make the game function the way that it's supposed to. Like, it's not a video game, so we can actually end up making errors, and that's a problem, and we want to all work together to prevent that problem. And the only exception to that is missed triggers. Contracts we will not be enforcing. So you can make contracts with people. You can make deals. Don't attack me. I won't do this. You can make those type of offers. But the tournament organizer, myself, will not be responsible for upholding those contracts. If there's a lot of backstabby kind of people making deals and not following through, then maybe we could come up with some type of like social uh, impact, like some type of article of clothing or something that they need to wear throughout the tournament because they broke their contract. But I'm not super interested in that. Honestly, that's not the way that I play. I look at this as an iterative series. So you're playing four games and then two more in the finals. Like if you just go back on your word, then I mean, everybody knows and that's just going to be it. And if you win the tournament by going back on your word, well, that's going to be even more notorious and everybody's going to know the next time when you try and make a deal that you're not to be trusted. So I personally would rather not play in that way. When I make a deal in a game, I stick to it. Uh, but you are free to break it and see how that works out for you. I'm not recommending it, but it is a valid tactic. Uh, it is a legal tactic. may not be the wisest, but it's not going to be enforced by the TO. And then king making. So there is a little bit of talk about king making. I seem to kind of notice the lines along people that like play tournaments and people that don't. So at the end of the day, king making is legal. If I, you're attacking me, and I can block your creature that will break up your combo rather than just dying. Like there are decisions that I can make. There's all sorts of different situations where king making. So to define it for those who aren't familiar, the person that is losing the game or doesn't have the ability to win the game ends up determining who does win. That's what king making means from a design perspective from a 
three perspective. So that's just going to be valid. If, for example, if you go to kill me and I can blow something up of yours because you're going to kill me, not only is that legal, but a little bit of strategy advice, maybe throw that out there ahead of time. Like that can be a deterrent. Like if you attack me, I'm going to make sure that this other person wins. So how about you cool your heels a little bit and we see if we can sort this out in a different way. So that's kind of the, the general idea is king making is sometimes frowned upon in certain groups that will not be enforced by the TO whatsoever. You're just going to be on your own there. This is playing to win. I mean, you're trying to literally murder the other person from a gameplay perspective. So if they hurt you in response, I mean, too bad. Like they, that does happen sometimes when you try and viciously eliminate your competition so that is it for now let me know if there's any other questions about the event uh looks like this didn't go too long i'd be happy to make another video about any other questions you guys have leave them in the comments below and let's get those final slots picked up we only have a handful of them left and i really want to see 40 people for this that'll be absolutely perfect we'll have 10 tables and make sure that they're nice full pods so that is this sunday may 15th at noon we'll see you then